Hello and welcome to episode 6 of Howl's Histories and today we're going to continue our tour through the First World War by looking at the year of 1917. And so 1916 had ended in disappointment, but on the Western Front at least, not defeat. In the East, however, the situation was worsening with the German conquest of Romania and growing discontent in Russia. Now the French now had a new, young, energetic commander-in-chief, a man called Nivelle, who had replaced Joffre in December of 1916. Now he'd done very well at Verdun the year before, and he promised that he had a new, bold plan to win the war in 1917 with what he called the spirit of the offensive. In this plan, the British would launch a diversionary attack at Arras to pull German troops away from the French army, much like they'd done the year before at the Somme. And then the French army would break through the German lines and then fight a war of manoeuvre in the open. Later on, the British troops would then break out as well at Ypres and the Belgians would attack at Dixmude and a French corps would then race up the Belgian coast. A bold and ambitious plan. Haig doubted that it could be done, but Nivelle convinced the British Prime Minister Lloyd George, and he insisted, he made Haig go ahead with the plan. A lot of the French generals were also very doubtful that this plan could be achieved, and they asked the French government to delay until the Americans had entered the war. But Nivelle threatened to resign if the attack didn't go ahead, and the French government backed down. Now, Nivelle had hoped to begin his attack in the February of 1917, and had he done so, they might have had some success, but he delayed and delayed to allow him to more time to finalise the plan. Now, just as in 1916, Haig doesn't want to attack at Arras, he wants to attack at Ypres. But the French are in charge on the Western Front. Theirs is the larger of the two armies, and it's on their soil. And our Prime Minister, Lloyd George, doesn't trust Haig. Uh, the plan called for the British to attack at Arras, beginning on the 8th of April. The French would attack on the 12th. But bad weather delayed the British attack till the 9th and the French attack to the 16th. Now, 1917 had begun well for the British, however. Haig and the, the British 5th Army had launched a series of small but effective attacks, biting little chunks off the German lines. In the Alps, the Italian army had appeared to finally start to make progress fighting against the Austrians. In February of 1917, however, it showed that the German army had not been idle. And in February, they pulled back from their front lines, abandoning a swathe of, of worthless French territory to fall back to a thick new defensive line, the so-called Hindenburg Line. On the way to this new line, they destroyed villages and they poisoned wells. The withdrawal strengthened and shortened their line. Uh, removing the salient, the bulge in a line that the French and British had planned to attack. It also allowed the Germans to withdraw troops from the Western Front, because their Western Front was now so much shorter, and send these extra troops to the Alps, halting the Italian progress dead. Now, despite the change to the front line, expectations for the new French offensive were sky high, and... It has to be said, the Germans are still deep in France. And so the attack would go ahead. Despite the fact there is now no bulge in the line for this offensive to attack, Nivelle decides that he will continue with his offensive. And they're going to attack along a 40-mile front between, and apologies for my pronunciation, Sasson and Riem. Now, in March, on other fronts, on the 11th of March, British troops captured Baghdad. On the 12th of March, however, you have the first Russian Revolution. Now, this is not the Communist Revolution. This is, uh, this is the Provisional Government, a supposedly democratic government taken over from Tsar Nicholas. Now, the Tsar was a weak man, uh, ill-suited to the stresses and strains of government, and he'd made the disastrous decision of taking command of the army in Russia himself, uh, which meant that there was 
nowhere else for the blame to go. Uh, every nation struggled in the First World War, and they normally then just sacked the chief general and brought in a new one who would also struggle with the demands of the war. But when Tsar Nicholas took personal command, then there was nowhere else for blame to go. Now, the provisional government, supposedly democratic, however, the problem was that they'd been elected when they were just an advisory parliament. They'd not been elected to run the country. And when the First World War had broken out, that parliament had been dissolved. These are simply the people who refused to go home. So even on the day that the, the Russian provisional government announced the, the creation of their new government, one of their own supporters from the crowd shouted out, Who voted for you lot then? Which is hardly the best of starts. Now, But they're going to create a new democratic Russia, but they're not going to withdraw from the war. They're going to carry on the war because so much has been lost, so many Russians have died, that now surely they have to have the rewards of victory. And remember in 1916 the Russian army had fought very, very well. The Brusov offensive had been successful and so the Russians will, for now, carry on in the war. But there is a question though of who now are they fighting for? The Russian army had fought so well for the Tsar. God save the Tsar! Now, who exactly are they fighting for? And what's happening at home? Because the provisional government's talking about handing out land to the people at home, and the soldiers at the front want their share. Will they get it? Now, on the 31st of March, 1917, Germany's most powerful ally, Austro-Hungary, asks for peace. They say they have had enough. Their army has been all but destroyed by the Russian army. They have lost the war and they're desperate to be able to pull out while there's still an Austro-Hungary left. However, Germ Germany halts it. They hear of the Austrians pleading for peace and they take over the Austrian government. Austro-Hungary is now nothing but a satellite power of Germany. And on April the 6th, the Americans enter the war. But their army is tiny. And they're determined that they're not going to just simply send their troops to prop up the British and French. No, they're going to create a brand new army. And they hope that this army will be ready by 1920. And so they're going to train, they're going to practice, they're going to gather huge numbers of men. But they're not going to be able to make much of an impact in the short term. They simply don't have a large army to send, much like the British didn't in 1914. But at least the British had a very experienced, very tough army from Imperial Policing. The Americans don't have the same, and so they don't have a, a hard core to, to send to, to the Western Front. And so we come to the French and British offensive, the battles of Arras for the British and Chemin de Dame for the French. Now the plan is that for the French, surprise is essential. Unfortunately for the French, surprise is completely lacking. The German army had the high ground, and remember they'd pulled back from their original front line. And so from the high ground they watched the French occupy the ground that they'd abandoned, and then watched the French drag the heavy guns into place for the offensive. They'd also, disastrously for the French, captured a complete copy of the French attack plan before the battle began, so they knew precisely where and when the French were going to attack. On the 2nd of April, the French artillery started to pound the German lines. On the 7th of April, Novell is told that the Germans have actually captured his plans and the Germans know what's coming. But Novell decides he's going to go ahead with the attack anyway. And has to said, it must also be said, he doesn't tell Haig that the Germans know what's coming. Now, the British plan is initially has some similarities to the plan from the Somme. In 1916, the British would attack along a 27,000-yard front. Arras will be along a 25,000-yard front. But the British, as we're going to see, have learned a lot of important lessons from the Somme. And so, although betrayed in many ways by their allies, not warned about what they're going to be sent into, Nonetheless, they're going to try and do a better job than the year before.